David Gellis is the author of uh, The Man Who Broke Capitalism. It's a, a book about Jack Welch. David, thanks for chatting with me today. Thanks so much for having me. I wanted to kick off with a question uh, about Americans in general. Why do you think Americans revere CEOs so much? And uh, and then why does Jack Welch stand out um, amongst the crowd of all CEOs? It, it's a question that's sort of central to this book because it was only through sort of our collective reveration uh, and veneration of Welch that we as a society allowed him to be so influential over such a long period. And to get at the root of why it is this society seems to put our bosses up on pedestals, we need to look back, you know, well over a hundred years um, to the way in which sort of this up by the bootstrap self-made capitalist identity is really central to the American story. Think about the robber barons and some of the early industrialists to, who rose to such great uh, heights. If you think about more recently some of the technologists and the way in which we celebrate uh, entrepreneurs who are able to create amazing new breakthroughs and products, this worship of CEOs in a big, diverse country that never had a monarchy, that doesn't have one unified religion, that is increasingly sort of polarized and fractured, the common identification of our business leaders as some of the most important and perhaps some of the last sort of cultural touchstones who can be relevant to society at large uh, is, is just a part of this story and I think it helps explain some of the reasons we've got some of the problems we do today. Welch, and I, I'll take a breath here and let you jump in, but Welch, I argue in the book, and I've got the goods to back it up, he was the first celebrity CEO. He was the first to marry this uh, you know, American reverence of CEOs with the modern media ecosystem, and he used it to disastrous effect. So I guess, how did he, how did he become the celebrity CEO? A lot of what I discovered as I began researching this book was that, as is the case with so many of you know, pivotal, iconic stories, it was a mix of the right person in the right place at the right time. So when, when Jack took over GE in 1981, yes, he brought to the job this visceral ambition, this ruthless, relentless hunger, this belief that he could make GE the most valuable company in the world. And it was mm -hmm. that inherent drive that allowed him to do so much of the things he did. But the company he took over was a critical part of the story too. And it was yeah. GE, you know, one of the biggest, most revered, influential, successful companies in the history of the American story that gave him the cover, that gave him the uh, clout and credibility he needed to make these changes so effective. And of course, he did it at a moment when indeed the economy was going to change mm -hmm. irrespective of him or GE. 1981 was a pivotal juncture in the global economic story. As globalization is on the ride, as Japan and Germany are sort of recovering from the war, as technology is making all sorts of new things possible, as Finance is percolating and is, is right on the cusp of really breaking out. It's the right man at the right company at the right time. And he runs with it and masters the media ecosphere as well. He learned how to work the press like almost mm -hmm. no CEO in his day. So in the book, you draw a line from uh, Jack Welch to the uh, uh, Boeing 737 MAX uh, issues, disasters, and however you want to describe it. Um, I'm curious, um, you know, that, that seems like an abstract line to draw. I'm curious like what that line is and, and how you came to that conclusion. Starting in 2019, I was one of the reporters at the New York Times who started digging into Boeing after the second mm -hmm. crash of the 737 MAX. And it was very clear early on what the technical problem with the plane was. There was a bad piece of software called MCAS that relied on one flimsy sensor on the fuselage of the plane. So we understood, in theory, what caused the planes to crash. What we started understanding as we dug deeper, though, was that there was a cultural story. And that mm -hmm. over the past 25 years, 
something fundamental had shifted inside Boeing when it came to the priorities, when it came to what made that company tick. And when we started trying to understand that cultural change, it was a story of Jack Welch. Starting yeah. in 1997, three CEOs who had studied at Jack's knee at GE took over Boeing, starting with Harry Stonecipher, then mm -hmm. Jim McNerney, and even today, the current CEO, Dave Calhoun. And they deliberately, explicitly tried to make Boeing a company that was more like GE. And in doing so, they transformed one of the great American manufacturers, a company that for nearly 100 years had been focused on aeronautical engineering, mm -hmm. into one that at the end of the day was motivated by financial engineering. And then that, that culture focusing on that financial engineering is, uh, I guess, how does that lead to the, the, the crashes? It, it's a critical question. I'm glad you, you pushed on it. What we saw in the actual inner workings of Boeing, and the records came out through congressional inquiries where they released mm -hmm. thousands of pages of documents and messages between mid-level employees in this company, was that engineers and test pilots we're thinking about the stock price when mm. they make decisions about safety. Mm. And at that granular level, you know, the awareness of the company's stock price had percolated all the way down to the, the level of people who should not be thinking about that. They should be thinking about mm. the, you know, the, the quality and the safety of this plane. And even before that, it was in 2011 when Boeing faced this critical juncture where it was faced with the loss of a major order, a defection by American Airlines, who gave sort of the Boeing CEO, Jim McNerney, a courtesy call and said, by the way, we're about to go with Airbus for a big order. And, mm -hmm. and he said, wait a sec, you can't do that. You've been a Boeing customer exclusively for decades now. Give us a shot. They said, but you don't have uh, 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 anything that's close to this new Airbus plane. And he said, give me a week or two. And it was in those few days that Boeing decided to redesign the 737 one more time. In doing so, rather than design a whole new plane that was suitable and brought up to date for the late 20th, early 21st century, instead it went back to the drawing board and tried to re-engineer and tinker with a plane, the 737, that had been introduced in the 1960s. And it was that decision that set in motion this cascade of decisions and design changes that required this flawed piece of software to be put in the plane in the first place and that's all drawn you know that's all due to this focus on on maximizing shareholder value you know that cornerstone of jack welch's um ideology if you if you call it that is around uh considering every, every decision should be about maximizing shareholder value and um, in 2008 or 2009, I believe it was, he was on the record in a, in a Forbes article saying that the maximizing shareholder value is, uh, quote, the dumbest idea in the world. Um, do you believe he meant that? Uh, and if, if not, why did he say that? What's your, what's your take on, 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 on that quote? Jack Welch was a master of reading the room. And uh, I think he understood in that moment, right, in, in, in the year after the financial crisis, in a year during which it had become clear what that kind of economy led to, mm -hmm. it doesn't come as a surprise that he was, you know, espousing something that his actions over 20 years as a CEO uh, demonstrated he believed the exact opposite of. So, no, I don't believe that he uh, had fully renounced the pursuit. A conversion. No, there was no great conversion moment. No. Now, listen, I, I, I've spoken with enough CEOs over the years to recognize that uh, many of them uh, are expert at telling themselves a story where they are not the bad guys. Sure. And so was there a certain amount of rationalizing going on and was he saying that in all his decisions that he made to maximize shareholder value at GE he was actually motivated by something else I, I don't know I can't get inside his head but you need only look
look at his public statements during his time as CEO and in the aftermath of his retirement to understand that he was on record as saying the purpose of a business is to increase its profits, essentially mm -hmm. parroting Milton Friedman. Friedman, yeah, exactly. And when he was asked by the Wall Street Journal what he believed his greatest legacy was, he said it was clear. It was making GE the most valuable company on earth. So if that doesn't demonstrate the fact that he clearly was obsessed with shareholder value. I, I, I don't know what does. And he's judging value, obviously, by just uh, by market capitalization. Absolutely. And yeah, he, yeah. Uh, he, he set out. He's not saying for doing good in the world. No. Yeah. <laughs> he set out to make GE the most valuable company on earth. And yep. he did it, right? And he did yep. it, which is remarkable, right? And and so some people say, how did he get away with it for so long? And the answer is because in the short term it worked, right? It like, works, yeah. He, he kept the music going uh, mm -hmm. for for well, twenty years. But look at what happened the minute he left. Things started to fall apart immediately. GE never recovered, and it was just last year that the company's current management announced that it would be broken up once and for all. I'm curious uh, about how this ideology, how Jack's, Jack Welch's ideology contributes to, um, uh, we'll say in the U.S., income inequality. I'm not an academic who has studied inequality in a deep way, but mm -hmm. those who have, including most famously Thomas Piketty, draw a direct line between executive compensation, its absolutely relentless upwards trajectory, over the last mm -hmm. several decades, and the widening gap between the haves and have-nots in, mm -hmm. like in countries like the United States. So that academic research is well established at this point. And if you pair Welch's own enormous executive compensation, you know, it got to the point by the end of his career that he was on the Forbes list of the 400 richest Americans simply mm -hmm. for being a people manager, right? Like, mm -hmm. he didn't invent anything. He didn't yeah. found a company. Mm -hmm. He was a boss. He was, he was hired help. And yet mm -hmm. he became something close to a billionaire by doing so. Setting the precedent for hundreds of other managers over the past several years to do the exact same thing, by the way, to the point where now we don't even blink when a hired help is rewarded with a 20 or $50 million a year pay package. Mm -hmm. and so as all that is happening, what's happening to his workers? They're getting laid off en masse. He's outsourcing them to contractors who don't pay nearly as good a wage as, as GE once did. He's offshoring, sending jobs overseas, trying to put companies, uh, every factory on a barge, who as mm -hmm. he liked yeah. to, to fantasize about. And look at what's happened to the American minimum wage over the mm -hmm. past so many years. It's stuck at seven twenty-five an hour. If it had just kept pace with inflation over the last 20 years, it would be closer to $25 mm -hmm. an hour. But we mm -hmm. live in this world that was shaped by Jack Welch's priorities, and we're still trying to dig out of that hole. So why this book and why now? Like you could have taken on any project, right? You have your choice of what you want to write about. And why, why was this interesting to take on right now? I wrote the corner office for the last five years for the mm -hmm. New York Times. And I got to interview hundreds of CEOs. It was a real privilege. Mm -hmm. uh, but I got insight into sort of what makes them tick, what's in their heads. And after a couple of years, I realized that one name kept coming up. <laughs> and it was Jack Welch's name. And... Some people would bring him up in reference to everything they aspired not to do. And others mm -hmm. still look to him as guidance for how they ought to comport themselves, right? But it was clear that either way, he was sort of living rent-free in the minds of CEOs today. Mm -hmm. And that just bugged me. It was just a question mark more than anything else. I was like, why do I mm -hmm. keep hearing this guy's name? He hasn't been a CEO for almost 20 years now. And then I hit the Boeing story. And when mm -hmm. the Boeing story landed and I described how that really became a Jack Welch story, it clicked for me. And I was like, oh, this is the guy that explains why we are in such a messed up world today. This mm -hmm. is the guy, not only who explains it, but who's responsible for it. So what is the antithesis to Welch's ideology? Um, what, what is, what's the counterpoint? Is it gaining any traction? 
there's a temptation, I think, and by myself included, to imagine that something as simple and sort of squishy as stakeholder capitalism represents that antithesis. But mm-hmm. I really believe it, that it's really just the very first steps. It's the those these are sort of the opening awkward remarks in a conversation mm-hmm. about what a more equitable economy is actually going to look like. And so we are starting to see that, right? And I'll try to answer your question more directly in just a sec. But as I think about the sort of 80 years covered in the book from the, the moment right after World War II and the way companies were behaving back then, this quote unquote golden age of capitalism to the highly unequal society we live in today, I recognize that this was a, a generational project to, mm-hmm. to institute the priorities of Friedman and Welch and Friedrich Hayek and Chainsaw Al Dunlap and all these other mm-hmm. characters who just relentlessly prioritize shareholder value above everything else. And in the same way, it's going to be a generational project and it's going to take decades to rebalance things if we're able to get there. And so I think what we're seeing now with the all the talk of shit, stakeholder capitalism and ESG and the, the 2019 business roundtable statement on the mm-hmm. purpose of a corporation is maybe that moment in a pendulum's arc where it, it sort of pauses and starts to perhaps begin its trajectory back in the other direction. Uh, and I hope we're there because we need to reset. And in practice, listen, what that would look like, I lay out some practical suggestions at the end of the book. Mm-hmm. We need to take better care of our workers. We need to give them better wages and better benefits. We need to offer them equity, right? The the distribution of corporate profits over the last 50 years has gotten wildly out of whack. And there's no law that says that shareholders and executives are entitled to this enormous slice of the pie, right? These sure. are choices that people make mostly men, mostly white men, right? These are choices that rich men make about how wealth in the society is allocated. And we have the opportunity to change that, right? Mm-hmm. And so let's start talking about what is fair, what is equitable, and beyond that, what actually is healthy for the economy in the long term? Because we're starting to see that this trajectory has led us to a place where Cities in the middle of the country are hollowed out. Communities across the country are starved for resources. Tax dollars are not there in the way they ought to be to fund things Mm -hmm. like education and infrastructure. And again, these are choices we've made. And we can make Mm -hmm. other choices that create a different kind of economy. A lot of my uh, readers are founders themselves or somehow in the the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Um, and I'm curious if there is any lessons for an early stage founder to be kind of digesting from uh, from Jack Welch. Uh, this is fun. I haven't had this question before, so I, I have to I have to really like give me a, give me a set. Um, yep. It's a great question. And the first thing that came to mind was what not to do. <laughs> exactly. And. and uh, there's a moment in the book where I talk about stack ranking. Stack ranking is it, a popular management system uh, that was you know, popularized by Welch himself at GE in, in the 80s, where you sort your people into A, B, and C players. And it's often 20% A players at the top. Everyone gets an A grade. It's a forced curve. Uh, 70% in the middle, B players, you're fine. And 10% at the bottom, C players. Jack said all those C players, 10% of GE every year, out the door. So it was this forced culling of the workforce. And what was so astonishing is that not only did it take root in other big companies like Microsoft, but it, it continues to this day to show up in companies like Uber mm-hmm. and WeWork. And uh, the stories that have come out of those two companies in particular <laughs> about what that to the culture. Mm-hmm. Um, and right, and those, those companies had cultural problems for other reasons as well. But employees who were there during those times talk about stack ranking and just the absolutely corrosive effect it had on culture to the point where part of your job essentially became finding a colleague who you could make look bad to your boss so you could be more secure in your own job. 
which is yep. just it's a Lord of the Flies. It's terrible. The more so, people you push down, the more secure you are. And uh, right. but is that really good for the company? Certainly not good for the people. But is, is it even good for the company? Uh, I, I would argue not. Right. So so yeah. that's one thing that comes to mind. And the other thing, and I think Welch is not the only one who's done this, but he was he was just a brutally uh, uncompassionate manager. Right. Mm -hmm. and some of that was maybe a product of the times. And, and I think he was emblematic of it and, and maybe one of the most extreme examples of it. But he was crass. He was rude. He was argumentative. He was uh, at a serious strain of alpha male machismo, mm -hmm. um, often sexist, um, derogatory uh, remarks in him that would sort of flow forth. And listen, in something I don't think he could get away with today, he talked about shooting people and what he yeah, meant exactly. was firing them. But it's that kind of you know violent rhetoric that caused loyalty inside GE and the culture inside GE under Jack to, to, to crumble. David, thanks for your time. Um, if people, uh, of course, they should go pick up the book. They can find it anywhere book, books are sold. Um, if they want to be following your work, um, where should they find you? I write for the New York Times, where I focus on climate issues and the intersection of the private sector and public policy. I share all my stories on Twitter, though I don't tweet a whole lot beyond that. Uh, and I'm also on LinkedIn, where I try to j engage in sort of meaningful discussion with people uh, about what's going on in the workplace.